Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC. Hello and welcome, CC. Hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> there we go, rolling. It is hard. You take on you take on other people's trauma, and then you go home and you kind of sit with it too. It just sort of overwhelms me with this sort of like responsibility to one, tell their story in an authentic way, but and also just look at their stories as asset based and not deficit based because that's how I see them. I'm giving myself the opportunity to be able to tell these stories. Nobody else is giving me the opportunity. I have two directing credits for documentary films and you wanna know why? because I went out and made them. This film, I'm shooting it myself. That's me making my own opportunities. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 64. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. When I started this podcast around 21 months ago, I had an only slightly more than vague notion about what this whole documentary life thing was about and that I was putting out into the world with my podcast. Actually, I was just a few days ago reminded by Steph that when I began the documentary life, it was initially not a podcast at all. It was something quite different from that, as you'll see from this conversation that I was recording the other night during one of our meetings for TDL. Just before the new year, yeah. like literally a couple of days before, between yeah. Christmas and New Year, I was working on my blog and I said to you, I'm really surprised you don't have a blog because you love writing. Yeah. Maybe it's something you should think about. And then you were like, yeah, that's true. I love writing. Having a blog would be good. I'll think about it, blah, blah, blah. Within 24 hours, <laughs> as you do, because, you know, once you have an idea, that's it. <laughs> You've got this blog up. <laughs> <laughs> called The Documentary Life. No, was it called that then immediately, though? It wasn't? I thought I don't it was. Know. I think, it could have been. No, I, yeah, it was I very like early on. I feel that was from the very beginning. It was very it? early on, yeah. No, yeah. you're right there. It was, it was before you even said about the podcast thing. So, and I think you did one or two posts. I remember seeing yeah. it up there and like reading it and stuff. And then you said, I can't remember exactly how you broke it to me, but you were very sheepish when you broke it to oh, me. Oh God, I'm sure. Something, because I think you weren't sure how it would work yeah. and you knew you'd have to put money into it. Right, oh yeah. So, I'm you to justify like, the expense. You know, I've been listening to one more <laughs> podcast recently and I, you know, I loved my radio days. So I was thinking maybe I might do, you know, a podcast. I would only need this very simple equipment. Right. And then you bought I remember the piece, yeah. One. And then you had to buy another So as you've just heard, the documentary life was initially supposed to be kind of a journal meets blog kind of thing. I'd intended to mix helpful essays with practical tip articles, with real life doc filmmaking stories, as well as stories of all of the other things that comes with living life as a documentary filmmaker. 
Thankfully, I shifted my energies away from this idea when I suddenly became really attracted to this idea of doing a podcast. And as Steph also mentioned, I'd recently really been getting into podcasts and I was appreciating their their power to reach large audiences with a relatively straightforward DIY approach. And I was pretty intrigued at the prospect of getting behind the mic again, something I'd done as a radio vet in a prior life. And even when I'd come to that decision that I was going to be doing the documentary life as a podcast that didn't necessarily provide any more clarity on what I was going to be presenting with this documentary life idea, but I figured it would kind of develop within the show. And what I'm about to play you here, this was how I first described the documentary life podcast in our first episode. Hello, 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 and welcome to the very first episode of The Documentary Life, a podcast in many ways about living your dreams, more specifically, your filmmaking or documentary dreams. As you could hear, interestingly or perhaps tellingly somehow, really not all that much has changed since that first episode in terms of how I introduced episodes nowadays. The format went from a bi-weekly to a weekly format back in July, and we were dividing the episodes up between a segment that I hosted myself on a given topic, followed by a shared conversation with an industry person. And since then, the show has shifted slightly with a little more focus on the shared conversation segment, and the two segments tend to be a lot closer in terms of theme or topic. It used to be at times the segments were very standalone and, and oftentimes didn't have anything to do with one another. But the one thing that hasn't changed at all is why we're doing this show and what the show is about, which at the heart and soul is still driven by living and leading this idea of a documentary life. Now, if you were to ask me how I'd define a documentary life, I'd still not necessarily have a completely 100% concrete way of doing this. That may seem like an odd thing to hear since I've been doing this podcast for nearly two years. It's just that I haven't really found an entirely succinct way to describe a documentary life. I mean, there are just so many components that go into a documentary life, right? And in fact, I'm I'm actually in the middle of constructing a workshop and a future course that's all about living and leading this idea of a documentary life. There are certainly a multitude of ways in which we all live our doc lives. And now that I say that, I guess that kind of leads me to where I'm always headed with the show and its meaning, if you will. You see, I've always thought of a documentary life as whatever it is that we do as independent filmmakers and how we do whatever it is that we do in such a way that our documentary films, they become a primary focus for our lives. It doesn't necessarily have to be, and in many cases, as you'll see in our upcoming conversation with doc filmmaker Margaret Byrne, it probably shouldn't be our first and foremost priority, as a number of us may have families or be taking care of family members, for example, but that while it's not the number one priority, it's probably not far from being a priority number two, eh? I'd even add that in some ways, I'm defining my personal doc life all the time. That each and every day, I seem to be discovering and employing more ways in which I'd like to define how it is that I live and lead my own documentary life. Right now, I'm still taking on commercial jobs. Steph and I are doing both the podcast and then of course our recent membership venture, Docland. We're currently doing it in western New York, where I'm originally from, but we could be doing it next year in Asheville, North Carolina, or maybe just down the road in Buffalo, New York. We've already done it in Portland, Oregon, or Phnom Penh, Cambodia, in the UK. This is how we've wanted to live our lives geographically. We're not necessarily interested in being in one particular spot. And truthfully, ever since we got married and started having kids, we always remained pretty vigilant about being able to do our work and do our films from wherever we wanted. And that quite possibly that might mean a whole bunch of different places in ours and our kids' lifetimes. But that's just how and where we've currently chosen to live our doc lives. And that could certainly change over time. And it's most certainly not how you guys live and lead your own doc lives. Some of you are working in broadcast news and working on your doc projects on the side. 
Some of you have corporate video gigs while you're doing your doc films. A doc lifer like Academy Award nominee Steve James, he's one of the few who has found a way to basically basically make his living doing almost exclusively the documentary work, as he's already developing other projects when he's in post on a film. He's been able to do it in such a way and, and carve out a career doing this. We've got another doc lifer who runs a very successful law firm and has recently decided to invest in equipment and to put his free time into exploring documentary films. And that just proves out even more how tricky it is to perfectly define what it is that is a documentary life. Because the truth is, we are all in our own ways defining our doc lives every day in however best benefits our own lives and our own film projects. Now this all being said, that doesn't mean that there aren't ways in which we can learn from one another how to best live our doc lives. If you've been a listener of the program at all, you know that I've already discussed numerous topics that can be tied to this idea of a documentary life. We've talked about finances and debt as a filmmaker. We've talked about being part of a filmmaking family. We've talked about the importance of leading a balanced and healthy life as a doc filmmaker, and that's just to name a few. We've had on numerous guests who've been on the show telling their own stories and providing some brilliant advice on on not only how to make a documentary film, but how to live your life in such a fashion that you can keep making your doc films. But I have to say, at least to this point, no guest that I've had on this program has been able to better exemplify what we might have been defining over the past near two years as living and leading a documentary life than our upcoming guest, Margaret Byrne, a single mom doc filmmaker and professor based out of Chicago, USA, a MacArthur Foundation grant recipient who has spent nearly seven years working on her most recent award-winning film, Raising Bertie. Her journey to and with documentary filmmaking is one that I thoroughly enjoyed learning about, and I think you will too. I can promise you that it will be one of the most real, down-to-earth, no-holds-barred looks at what it means to live and lead this thing that we've all come to define as the documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. Thank you for joining me today. There are plenty of places online to learn how to do things like split the audio signals coming into your camera, or how to animate some of your still photos, or get some great tips on lighting your interview, many blogs, YouTube videos, and of course podcasts where you can quickly grab an answer to a tech-related question. But what if there was one place where you could learn from beginning to end how to make a documentary film, and how to become a doc filmmaker, how to raise money and build an audience for your doc, how to form strategic partnerships and launch your doc out into the world, and perhaps even, if you can imagine, make some money from it? Well, there is such a place, and it's called the Documentary Academy. Steph and I took two years to build out this comprehensive resource that takes you step-by-step from story creation and pre-production all the way to post-production, launch, and distribution. The Academy takes you through your doc filmmaking journey as your most confident, active, strategic, creative, focused, and articulate self. It is a step-by-step guide to empowerment in the documentary filmmaking world. We know what we have in the Documentary Academy. Now it's up to you to discover what you have as a doc filmmaker. Do that today by heading over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. to have on doc filmmaker Margaret Byrne today to speak with us. Certainly we will be speaking to Margaret about her recent film work, in particular Raising Bertie and then her current doc project. But I'm also excited to talk with Margaret because I feel like 
of all the guests that we have had on the program over the past year and a half, and no pressure here, Margaret, I feel like Margaret can can really speak to this idea of how one lives and leads a doc life. First and foremost, before we get into this, I should say thank you so much for joining us today on The Documentary Life, Margaret. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, so Margaret, I, I, I should say right at the out, outset, interestingly enough, I came by your information, and perhaps this is a little bit of a shout out actually to one of our listeners, a doc lifer by the name of Rich, who recommended you uh, fairly recently via, I think it was via Twitter, and that's how you and I ended up, ended up connecting. And, um, and then at that point, and, and after doing a little bit of research um, into you and, and your film work, I realized that earlier in the, in the year we had had, I should say, or midway through last year, we had Gordon Quinn of Cartem Quinn on the show. And I'm now remembering that he had mentioned your film, Raising Bertie, and mentioned you and uh, had actually himself as well re- re- uh, recommended you for the program. So, hey, here we are. And that's awesome. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Gordon is great. He's actually, um, he's a story consultant on the film I'm producing now. And really, you know, I'd say was probably the first person that really understood Raising Bertie yeah. and what, what that film was really about. And we, so. and we will definitely get to that. Margaret, what might be nice for us is if we could paint a little bit of a picture of your background so we can kind of learn how you came to this, this doc life. Um, I understand that you received your BFA, uh, BFA in film at the University of Illinois in Chicago in 2000. And then it looks like you went on to do some, some, some music video uh, work. I, it looks like, I, I think you worked for Universal Music. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I was eventually a creative director at Universal Music and worked primarily with uh, Matriarch which is Mary J. Blige's uh, label. So I worked with her um, for almost a decade um, on and off uh, and and also did a lot of things within that time frame too. Um, So I, uh, you know, helped launch the uh, first live series that premiered on MTV in Africa. I see that, right. When launched and... um, then I went on and lived in Nigeria for about a year okay. in Lagos okay. and where I was directing music videos because there was such a demand for um, music videos to be made at, at like a higher quality. And that was that was in 2005. But that really taught me how to, I think, even just step back as a director and calm down because... Mm. Anything that could go wrong went wrong. <laughs> I'm sure but, it did. How long you know, were you in Lagos? Um, I was there about a year. Okay, okay. And and how did you how did you end up there uh, initially? Was it through employment with MTV or, or yeah? How did you end up in Nigeria? Yeah, I was just an independent contractor working um, for MTV, but it was my friend Kevin Swain, who is a well-known music video director, directed a lot of Tupac videos. Mm back in the day and does a lot of um, live concert work. Hmm. So he he asked me one day, he's like, do you want to go to Nigeria? <laughs> and I said, okay. And it turned into, I actually, through the artist that, the, the, the first music video to play on MTV was by an artist named Two-Face. And that is how I met my husband and why I ended up living there oh, and wow. daughter and... We've since separated ten years ago, but um, yeah, that those are the stories of my twenties. Those are the stories of your twenties, okay? Yeah. yeah. But also, you know, working with Mary, I I got to travel a lot, yeah, yeah. Um, and and that was a great experience for me. And it also enabled me to because I did this web series called MaryTV.com. Mm-hmm. I think it's still there. But I'd make these like short three to four minute videos and I'd be putting them up, you know, like every few days. And it was the it was the second of its kind. 50 Cent had done this. And then oh, wow. she was at the same time working with Jimmy Iovine. And then and then we did this web series. And now you think of it and it's like there's video everywhere. Of course. Right. So, right. But you were kind of at the forefront that, of that with this series. All of that was very new mm. and exciting to be able to share stuff that quickly and make these sort of like episodes of you know what can this this uh new media be you know 
the shorter content. That's right. That's right. And so, so Margaret, at what point um, does documentary start coming into your life? Well, I, I think I was always really interested in documentary and I didn't quite know how to do it. Mm. I didn't quite know how to build a story. I remember filming my sister's family who had gone to Japan and I was able to go to Japan actually because I was traveling with Mary and visit her and 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 I was trying to make a short film out of it but I still you know like I still hadn't quite figured out how to do that right and it was really through working with Rada Film Group in Brooklyn who made American Promise yes really working on that film where I learned how to be a verte cinematographer mm, mm, mm. And, and learned also about documentary but even more how do you I mean they themselves were working and you know Joe and was a is a doctor is a psychiatrist and they had two kids and they're raising their family mm. and you know this film happens to also be about their family right so it was an interesting relationship making a film that the directors are in the film too um now a yeah, film like it, american promise which came out in two, 2013 i believe you were a cinematographer on it as well as an editor correct yeah yeah uh, additional editor so i yep. i was um which is also another place where i sort of honed my editing skills and learned what funders need so i would put together all the selects every year mm. that would go to the ford foundation right Right. Um, so they were getting money from the Ford Foundation every year to fund this film, and they would want to see, you know, what what did we film this year? Okay. Because it was okay. a thirteen year project, and I I worked on it, you know, on and off for eight years. So that that defi- that experience taught me a lot. And then of course you you dive in and you decide to start making your own film, and there's a lot you just have to figure out along the way. It's interesting that you worked on a longitudinal project like American Promise, which was a a 13 year a 13 year process, um, because you would then on, on your first full uh, full documentary film, which we'll talk about now, is of course is raising Bertie. That was also a lengthy, lengthy project for you. I think it's a great time to start talking about your experiences with raising Bertie. And I guess a great way to start that is why don't you give us maybe just a brief synopsis of what the film's about? Sure. So Raising Bertie is a film set in rural North Carolina, and it follows the lives of three young African-American boys, um, sort of coming of age in rural North Carolina. Um, And I came to the idea for the film um, in 2009, Mm. uh, me and my friend John Stuyvesant, um, who I went to school with at UIC, and we've had a long sort of creative partnership. And John was the the DP on the film, correct? Yeah, John was a DP and a producer on the film. Okay. Um, And was, I mean... John and Ian were really instrumental in making this film mm. happen. Mm. Ian Kibbe, who's also a producer on the film. Yes. Um, sort of at different lives in the film because it was such a long process. So it took eight years to make the film yeah. from when we started to when it was um, broadcast, basically, or um, played it full frame, rather. Yes. Uh, and so in 2009, um, I, again, I was working for Mary, um, but as I think as an independent contractor. And okay. so I was doing a lot of other things at the time, but um, it was through somebody I met through that work I was doing that I got a job to work um, on a, to make a short film about Vivian Saunders who ran the Hive, this alternative school right. um, in Bertie County. Which is highlighted in the film, of course. Which is highlighted in the film because it's where the film starts. Mm. And so it was through this, you know, three day trip that John and I took that we both kind of decided like, wow, this is really, because he was also a cinematographer on American Promise. Okay. And I think, I think we just realized the deficit of rural stories being told, oh, yeah. but also um, stories stories about rural education and, th- and that there was a different set of issues and that there this was like, you know, that this was a story that we really felt invested in telling and, and ultimately because we really connected with 
with the people very right. quickly. Right. Who, you know, I'm very close with to this day. They thought I was gonna drop out of school, but I know I can learn. I love the preacher. But I ain't want to stay on the phone the rest of my life. I don't want to ever be looked down on. Ever. If I play football, I'm hoping my daddy come to my games. You cannot allow these folks to take our program from us. I believe in myself. I believe in myself. And my ability to do my best. And my ability to do my best. I'm intelligent. I'm intelligent. I'm capable of greatness. I'm capable of greatness. One, two, three. Hey. 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 Lord God, we come today praying for this man. What in the world is going to happen to these boys? Have we given them the tools to be able to survive without getting into trouble? Margaret, we talk a lot on the program about this idea of, as, as documentary filmmakers, we're often faced with with going into a project with a, with, a, with a vision that we have in mind. We have an idea for our documentary films. And then when we start filming and we start working on the project and really kind of immerse ourselves in the process, something funny can often happen. And that uh, maybe an event happens where there's a shift in the story or another story um, or a turn sort of presents itself. And we talk a lot on the program about, about this idea of remaining open, you know, to remaining open to the story telling itself and, and this idea that events can shift your one's original idea. Now, this happened with Raising Bertie, did it not? Yes, it happened with Raising Bertie. It happened with the film mm. that I'm making now. Yeah, I mean, so with, with Raising Bertie, our plan was we were going to follow, we were going to follow three kids and follow Vivian at the Hive and really take a look at what this, school was providing for um, at-risk youth in Bertie and and why it was working. And then really early on into filming, the school right. shut down. Uh, so so you see that, you know, at the end of Act One, Vivian is losing all her, you know, her resource center, her, the hive. And you see these three young men that now are returning to the regular public school system, but a system that has right. not worked for them. And so, you know, it was sort of like, well, I was questioning at that point, mm. what is this film really about? Nobody wants to see a movie about young mm. black kids failing. Ultimately, these were kids that didn't do well in the regular school system. And now they're being thrown right. back into that system, whereas they had some agency with with Vivian in the hive. And, and that's yes. what I was interested in. But. But, you know, it, they'd become like family to us. And and obviously it's like, well, what am I going to do as a <laughs> filmmaker? Am I going to desert this story because it's probably not going to be very popular? You know, as far as like applying for grants, it's not it's not a story that people of are course. looking You know what I'm saying? That's why I said Gordon really understood hmm. what the movie was and... Um, that was that was really important. You know that that what happens when a program closes, and that's ultimately why the film you know took six years to film because I wasn't going to stop telling their story until they found some place of like they'd each sort of settled right. into their lives a little bit and and found success. And you see that success doesn't look the same for everybody. You've mentioned a few times how you became close with the people, the subjects of your film. And I think that that is, of course, in many ways, not an uncommon thing to happen to us as doc filmmakers. It, it, it's, it's almost expected. We spend, um, in, in, in relatively speaking, uh, we spend an enormous amount of time with our subjects. It makes sense that we get close with them. I guess my question for you is, 
are there times where we should be perhaps backing off from being close or is, well, maybe you can tell me, Margaret, for you as a filmmaker, and you can, you can include this with both, you can cite both Raising Bertie and then your current doc project. Are there dangers in getting too close to your subjects and, or what is your approach? Um, do you put, um, do you put any sort of professional wall up whatsoever, or do you always, do you find that that's not something one should do because then you don't remain open to your subjects? I mean, I think the reason why I've spent a lot of my life embedding myself in communities that are not my own and trying to understand their perspective and is because, you know, I think in some ways I don't feel like I belong where I come from and I'm looking for other places where I can relate to people and so ultimately I think I'm making films about people that I connect with and can relate to and be open with in a way that I'm probably not open with people you know as a professor or in my you know in other professional parts of my life where I have much closer friendships and relationships with like Day Day, mm. oh, he yeah. um, Day Day and Quay had their baby on oh, wow. December thirty first, and I they were they called me a half an hour after <laughs> Messiah was born, and I yeah. got to see him on Facetime, and I felt honored that I was that important, and I'm going I'm going there I'm going to speak at UNC the medical school uh, in a couple weeks. But really, to me, yeah, I look but... at it as an opportunity as I can <laughs> rent a car and go to Bertie and, and, and now I can see Messiah for real because yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen bet. him yet. So and just visit everybody and check in. And it's important to be there, too. Do you feel like we have a responsibility as doc filmmakers to kind of continue our connections with the lives that we've spent filming for so long? I, I mean, honestly, I think if it's not a natural yeah. thing, if it's forced then right. I don't know how that <laughs> makes anyone. sense. You know, every yeah. relationship is different. But even, you know, I'm so right now I'm making a film uh, that follows three. It's about the mental right. health crisis in Chicago. And it follows three participants that are in this mental health court program. So they've they've chosen to plead guilty to these charges and um, receive court mandated mm-hmm. treatment for two years. And in exchange, their record will be expunged. So that film has been a huge challenge because the only way that I could cast the film was by mm. observing at court. And then I have to, you know, I'm I'm trying to form relationships with people that are homeless, that are, un, you know, that are in really unstable times in their life. And obviously there's a huge responsibility yeah. on my part for That's right. how I tell these stories, whose stories I choose to tell, whose stories are not appropriate. But I I think making Raising Bertie has definitely been prepared me for making a film mm. like this that has really been quite a challenge. It took me 18 wow. months wow. to cast the film. And but but I mean right now I'm working with three people that I talk to mm. at least on a weekly basis. They um it's different because they don't live far away. So um, yeah. they're all in Chicago versus, you know, me having to drive 18 hours or take a plane. So I'm able to just like stop by and, you know, you know, just stop by and say hello and not not film and just hang out in that way. But it kind I can kind of fit it into all the other things I have to do to make my life work because mm-hmm. this is not a film that's funded and I've been working on it since 2015. Because this is another story where I had focused the story somewhere else and realized that that wasn't the story. Yeah, that's that's okay. what I'm working on now. And and just talking about um, sustainability and how do you how do you make a project like that? I do have some seed money which was spent, you know, uh, to make a demo. And um, but right now we're in okay. pretty much full production and. You know, it's it's just a matter of juggling a lot of things. Margaret, spending time in areas that may be poverty stricken, spending time with your subjects whose lives may not be as fortunate as our own. How do we how do we then after that process of spending so much time filming with them? How do we then go back to our to our 
I guess, in quotes, normal lives after that? I don't think I ever go back to my normal life. I think I'm sort of entrenched in, I mean, I was talking to Vivian before you called. Um, and I've talked, I've talked already to a couple of people from Bertie oh, wow. today, whether it's a text message or, or whatever, but I just, they're still with me. And, and so, but yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is hard. You take on, you take on other people's trauma and, and then you go home and you kind of sit with it too. And then it just sort of overwhelms me with this sort of like responsibility to one tell their story in an authentic way, but, and also just look at their stories as asset based and not deficit based because that's how I see them. I mean, even working on this mental health film, I mean, I'm, I'm working with people on a, you know, almost daily basis that are going through really hard times that have lost everything that have mm. lost custody of their kids. So if that means that I become their support and go to their child custody hearings with them, wow. I, I'll do that. Not because I'm filming, but because they, there's nobody else there for them, you know? So I, I think that I'm probably a very particular type of filmmaker and I get very invested in, in right. the people that I'm working with. And I look at them more as, you know, so one, one man that I'm filming is he's writing a book. He has schizoaffective disorder and bipolar, and he's writing about what it is to be schizophrenic in that. And he's, he's um, amazing and talented. And I kind of see how, you know, him writing his book is sort of, it's, we can relate to each other because in a sense, it's sort of like me making mm -hmm. this film, you know? Absolutely. And, and so they become active participants right. in the telling of their story because we're always talking about what what it is we're making and they're aware of it. One, one example is, um, yeah. so the woman that I'm filming, she she had to call the police in order to get her son back. And, and it was arranged through the court, but the paperwork mm. didn't say anything about it. And she had a restraining order. And so she called me. Holy and said, smokes. will you come with me? And so I'm I'm actually like running from, I was with the other person that I was filming to bring him sandwiches. Then I got to go pick up my daughter. And, and then I'm like, okay, how is this going to work? And what are we all walking into? And I've got my 11 year old here <laughs> sitting in the front seat. And here I am sitting in the back seat. Angela doesn't have a car. How does this scene even work? When CPD shows yep. up, they won't let me film. But it actually turned out to be one of the most amazing wow. scenes I've filmed, one yeah. of the most emotional scenes. And it was so, it was very traumatic. And I, I remember after I drove away, because the police, mm. I didn't have a car seat. And so when she gets her son back, you know, they're oh, like, boy. well, you can't get in the car <laughs> because we don't have a car seat. And so she ends up, you know, just just deciding to take the bus and and um so we drive away and I pull over and I just cried but I mean me being there for her in those moments I know has has like helped her in some way you know because she needed somebody to be there Margaret do you have people in your life who understand it and or appreciate what you do as a doc filmmaker and I ask this in the context of of all of us doc lifers you know what is the importance of our own community, of building our community and a support group? I, well, I think um, I have a great doc family here in Chicago, people that I could probably call for anything, um, and they would help me. And, and likewise, I would help them. Well, especially now being connected with Kartemquin, right? Yeah, Kartemquin is... I mean, that is the greatest thing about working with Kartemquin is working with Gordon hmm. um, and, and having a community of people hmm. that are really supportive. And, and it's not it's not competitive. It's like we're all trying to help each other tell these stories that that um, we're invested in and 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 really making 
out, you know, a lot of us don't have funded, fully funded films. Most of us. Most of us don't. So, <laughs> so how are we cobbling this together and getting it done? Yeah. Yeah. How does it, how does, how does working as a doc filmmaker, um, spending this time as a doc lifer, if you will, if you will, as we like to call it here on the show, how does that affect one's personal life? How does mm. it, how has, how has being a doc filmmaker affected your personal life, Margaret? My personal life. Yeah. I mean, one thing is I'm, one thing is I'm a single parent. And so I think that that probably dictates more than anything for me. Yeah. Cause that's sort of my, you know, my primary job in life is to make sure that Violet is, has everything she needs and is, you know, growing into an amazing person. Yes. And, and so I've sort of built everything I do around that. And so that means that I left New York and I came to Chicago, mm -hmm. which allowed me to not have to pay as many bills. So I don't have to work, you know, I don't have to do um, marketing work at Universal, mm. you know. Mm. And some people would look at this as like, well, you've stepped down. Yes, of course. You, you, right. You know? But I'm like, no, but I'm actually... No, I I'm just increased my life. <laughs> I'm giving myself the opportunity to be able to tell these stories. Yeah. Nobody else is giving me the opportunity. Right. I have two directing credits uh, for documentary films. Yes. And you want to know why? Because I went out and made them. And I had a friend like John along the way who helped me make this. This film, I'm shooting it myself. And I have a couple people that ha are helping and supporting me. And that's me building my own, making my own opportunities. It is. That's you building your own doc life in many ways. Because when you have somebody come to you and say, here's the money to make a movie, hmm. there's going to be a whole set of rules that comes with that. <laughs> I mean, in most situations. Yes. And so I'm, I'm just very careful of what I choose to work on. And, and I, think, I think that's important because it's easy to get caught up you know, it's like I know a lot of people in New York who are have such great ideas and aspirations, but they're working in reality television oh, because yeah. it's paying the bills. I, I've done plenty of work in reality television. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really trying to just stay focused and stay on this path. And hopefully, you know, I teach it to colleges and, and I really enjoy that. I like doing it part time, but I am a full time filmmaker. Yes. And, you know, as as I develop more projects, I hope that this will become sustainable for me. Right. And um, in the meantime, I figure it out and make it work mm. so that my second priority is getting the film done. Mm. First priority is Violet. Second priority is the film. Yeah. It sounds very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very <laughs> familiar. That's that's the story of my of uh, of of Steph's in my lives. We have a we yeah. have a, a one and a half year old and, and and a son that just turned four years old. And, oh, that's great. Yeah. And you know crazy. what? You know what has been great about this film journey too is mm. that I've had Violet and Kiki, who's um he's the little boy that's in raising Bertie. Yes, right. Day Day's nephew. So he stayed with us during the summers. Oh Him wow. And Violet are, a lot like brother and sister yeah. and so they were on with me last summer on our theatrical tour yeah and those two were selling t-shirts and, <laughs> and and at some points they'd get up and speak to to announce the t-shirts and then violet would want to talk about other things but it was just <laughs> a great experience for them to be you know traveling to all these different places and talking to different people and yeah you know, it had its stressful moments too because my car broke down and we were <laughs> stranded and it's like me and two kids and I'm trying to like at the same time, you know, we're traveling from one state to another and I'm like trying to keep up with like the press things I have to do. So yes. I have like a Skype <laughs> interview and he's like, do you have to be in the car? And I'm just sort of like, there's two kids in the back that he can't see yeah. and I'm kind of like, they're quiet right now and you're asking me if I have to be in the car right now like this is it this is what you get <laughs> you know uh, we wouldn't trade it for anything I feel like I feel like by 
you know, doing what, what Steph and I do as doc filmmakers and sort of living our and leading our own doc lives, we have already exposed our kids to so much that I know I certainly wasn't exposed to probably for the first 15 years of my life in some ways. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. uh, that's the beauty of the lives that, 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 that we're fashioning for ourselves, isn't it, Margaret? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm raising the most empathetic child. Totally. Because of the, you know, she was in North Carolina with me. She was there when Angela got her son back. Yeah. She, oh, wow. she's experiencing these things and it's just because this is her mom and, you know, I just how, how it's been. Well, you know? I mean, and, and conversely, you look at the subjects um, in your film and the people and many people in the community have a place like Bertie and, and they've had, you know, it, it's all about our environment, right? And so it's what we're brought up in. And, um, and yeah, I, we, we learn from that. And, and I, you know, our kids do too, by being exposed to these things. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say, Margaret, to our, to our doc filmmaking, uh, brothers and sisters, if you will, who might be struggling to make sort of the ends meet. And I ask this because, you know, I do, you know, I do get emails um, from listeners of the show who are who are re- out there really trying to live and, and lead this idea of a doc life, and and you can hear it, Margaret. You can hear the tone in their in in their emails that you know there's a str- there's a real struggle there, and it and and it could be emotional, it could be financial. My question for you is, you know, what kind of advice do you have for us to how do we pers- persevere with our doc projects our doc dreams our doc lives in the face of challenges um like financial challenges work challenge family challenges what do we do to stay true how do we stay on the path i mean one thing i think is that you have to be willing to take risks and so for me to make raising bertie i got into an incredible amount of credit card debt but I was able to work out of it. Wow. And it wasn't my first time because I'd moved to New York. Yeah. And the first project I made was a reunion, um, the a DVD that came out with the reunion album between Mary J. Blige and P. Diddy. Oh, wow. Called okay. Love and Life. <laughs> wow. And so it was a short film that came out with that DVD. Yeah. But I basically made that for free for nine months. Holy smokes. And so that was how I kind of got into that business. Yeah. It was like my unofficial internship, yep. you know, where yep. I had no idea what I was doing, but they loved everything I did because, you know, it was them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you need to take risks, which means like maybe you go into some debt or but but you figure it out and you know that you've got to, you know, if you're shooting a lot on your dock this month, you've got to somehow book some freelance jobs or, you know, have some other plan. But it, I think that if you wait to have the resources to make your project, right. your project might not get made. That's absolutely. And, and, and I think obviously it's beneficial if if you're not just directing and producing your film, if you're the DP on your film. You know, I've I've shot 60 hours on my film already mm-hmm. and zero zero money has gone into that. But my in-kind services, you know, if I were paying an, a DP to do that, yes, would be, you know, that would be a big chunk of change. So and it's just, you know, so you have to make the films that you can produce within the life that you're living. Yes. And then you can't choose work that is going to suck everything out of you. So like, um, that's why I started doing more DP work and not taking on editing work mm. because DP work you can do and then you can go home oh, yeah, and you, you walk do away what after else, you shoot. the other things <laughs> you have to do. Whereas if you take on an editing gig oh, or yeah. a long-term project, yeah. it can take over your work life and make it really hard. You know, then your project always gets pushed to the back burner. Yes. So that means you may be walking away from some opportunities and to, you know, your sister or your cousin or your family, you may look stupid. Like, well, why would you do that? You need, you have bills to pay and this, but, but you have to sort of look at your career in the long term. And it's not just about the one film. It's about the canon of films that you make. And, and it's a process to get each one done. And to me, I'm not in a hurry. You know, Mm. I want, I, I think it's also important that, it you know if if you are nominated for an oscar 
but yet your life is unhealthy because you've you've just killed yourself trying to do everything. Mm. You're not going to be happy. You still have to go home at the end of the day. And and so I think it's it's important to balance your own personal health too, which which has also been you know something that I've have been trying to figure out yeah. is how do you do all that? Because it's easy to get you know get in too deep and get super stressed out and and you don't have control you know so you finish a film and if you don't already have a broadcaster you don't know if somebody's actually going to want it (laughs) yeah and then you have a lot of bills to pay so there's you need people to open doors for you and and i you know i make it also a focus to mentor other people Mm. Um, I'm a mentor in the Diverse Voices and Doc program at right. Cartemplin. One of my friends who I mentored, um, who was in that program, Kelly Pope, she just put out a wonderful film called All the Queen's Horses yes. about the largest municipal fraud in Gordon had in the mentioned country. that as well when we spoke. She would be a fantastic person to talk to in okay, a totally great. different perspective. Yes. She's in a, a forensic accounting professor at DePaul. You know, wow, and, wow. <laughs> and sort of, you know, took on this filmmaking journey. Yeah. And and I think that she has other great projects to make. OK, I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to say, yes, you do. It's not your last one. Not your last one. <laughs> yes, but indeed. and she's found some really great success in. I mean, she's had more screening requests than any Cartemquin film ever. Unreal. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. And that's in, that's an incredible success. So also, I think filmmakers need to look at what do you really want and is the ultimate success, you know, there's only so many slots on, you know, PBS, on POV, on IT, on independent lens. Indeed. You know, and there's only so many films getting picked up by Netflix. I mean, of course, there's all these distributors. Mm. But um if if you don't get a national broadcast, you know, if your film is getting out there and in, into communities and doing what it's supposed to do, yeah. that is a huge success. And you need to look at those things too, but also be aware of what is your ultimate goal. Margaret, this has just been a fantastic conversation and the type of conversation and real conversation I've wanted to have with a doc industry person for, for quite some time. That 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 is that much is certain. Tell us how we can see Raising Bertie and then tell us when uh, when you think you'll be wrapped up on your current project, even though I already know the answer to that last one, because who knows, right? <laughs> I have plotted. I have a plan. I I do have a plan. Yeah. And I'm far enough that I think I can stick to that plan because yeah. I'm not I don't have a lot of indefinite things, you know. So the first part was. Oh, Raising Bertie, you can get it on Amazon, iTunes, uh, Google Play. But it also, uh, for Black History Month, is streaming for free on POV. And that's the PBS version um, where you can also download uh, educational materials. There's a lesson plan and an engagement guide. So there's a lot of good stuff there. And then uh, my film, Any Given Day... Um, which focuses on the mental health crisis in Chicago. Uh, I'm planning to be uh, done filming in about 18 months. And, and of course, unless something changes, but that's, that's right, not right. within my control. So, you know. Margaret, thank <laughs> you so much. This has just been an amazing conversation. Yes, thank you. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.